Thank you. <clears throat> wow. A lot of He-Man fans out there. Yeah. How many Skeletor fans? You all realize, of course, without Skeletor, there'd be no He-Man. Yeah. Because you have to remember, Skeletor believes in what he's doing just as much as He-Man believes in what he's doing. Yeah. He believes he's the answer to everybody's problem. He's a little more devious, but he believes in what he's doing. And uh, has anybody here, here ever heard of a guy called Joseph Campbell? <laughs> well, Joseph Campbell's one of my heroes. He also was the person that helped George Lucas finish the first Star Wars, his novel. Because even Lucas admits that without Joseph Campbell, he would have never finished. And Joseph Campbell's concepts about myths and legends and icons and things like that are ingrained in all of our, us creative artists' mentality. If you're going to tell a story, you need to understand Joseph Campbell. I suggest getting a hold of some books or going online and looking him up, and you'll be fascinated by this guy. He's gone now, but um, he left quite a legacy. And uh, it was a very important legacy to me because I came from a world of comic books and creating my own toys and stuff like that as a kid. And as an artist, it's always been integral to me to tell the story. Um, even if I'm doing something that you wouldn't think has a story to it, like a painting or something, I have to tell a story. I can't, I can't do it without telling some story. You may not understand it. My skills may not be good enough to, so that you can understand it, but I have to feel that I'm telling a story. Thank you for that. Now, we're gonna do a little back and forth, and I believe uh, I couldn't ask for a better moderator than I've got right here. I was hoping to have a panel so we could all argue, and maybe even strip down and get in a fight. But, uh, <laughs> It looks like I'm kind of alone, but uh, all your, all of your questions don't have to be positive. They can be, I'll try to answer anything, and if I can't answer it or won't answer it, I'll just tell you to go to hell, basically. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, Mark, what can you tell us about the creation of the Masters of the Universe toy line? The creation of the Masters of the Universe toy line uh, was done by Mattel Toys. At the time, uh, uh, I'm going to give it to you through my eyes, because that's the only way I can tell you. It's a subjective thing. I was hired to do packaging at Mattel, and in an uh, area they called development. And in the development area, we were supposed to make things look pretty. Uh, we weren't supposed to invent new things. We weren't supposed to come up with new ideas. We were supposed to make things look pretty, put it in pretty packages, and that included everything from Barbie to... Uh, Big Jim to the Clash of Titans, horrible things. Uh, I remember working on Battlestar Galactica. I mean, these things were, were uh, they didn't even pretend to understand the kid. And then um, I became bored because they don't give you enough to do at, at Mattel. I, I was sitting there and I was just having my own studio with my wife. And uh, I was just working like all night, lots. And it wasn't weird at all for me. So we got our masters, came out, started a studio, and we're working like crazy. I was asked to do freelance for Mattel. Then Mattel did what Mattel always does. They said, why don't you come to work for us and work inside? And I called my wife, I remember doing it. And I said, uh, hey, they want to hire me. And she says, uh, how much will they pay? Because we were pretty, you know, it was pretty, uh, Week by week, look, she's giving me this, this. <laughs> and uh, I, I told her what they pay me. And she says, you mean for only five days a week? And I said, yeah, and everybody goes home at five o'clock. And she said, do it for a year and then come back in the studio and forget it. Well, that was my, the beginning of a wonderful adventure for me in the toy industry. Because um, I went inside and I started working on Barbie, on... Uh, Oh, uh, Shogun Warriors, if you remember those things, and, ah, great, nice toys, very nice toys. Great. Perfect. And later on, I worked for the company that originally did them. 
But to get back to it, so I'm sitting there and they just, they can't keep me busy because I'm kind of a, an energetic kind of guy, at least I was when I was a little younger. And so um, I started drawing on something I'd worked on from the time I was about um, 11 or 12 years old, and it was this hero thing. Now, why did I start working on a hero thing when I was 11 or 12 years old? Well, do you remember when you were a little kid, especially the, the, the men here, and it seems like everybody is your boss. Teachers, parents, everybody tells you what to do, and you got to do it. At the same time, all of my uncles had come home from the war, and they were all heroes. I tracked them in the, on the maps, and I watched what they'd done, and they really were heroes. So they came home, and they were bigger than life, and that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be bigger than life, then nobody could tell me what to do. Well, that meant that you had to be strong, you had to be brave, and you had to really know how to suck it up. That, I got that from my uncle. But the fact was, as far as what I looked like, I knew one thing, and I think you'd agree with me. Whoever a hero was, I think I got this by looking at the uh, Greek literature and Tarzan and Prince Valiant and stuff like that. Are these names mean anything to anybody here? Yes. <laughs> you know, Prince Valiant was beautifully drawn by Harold Foster, and I would draw on it, and I would read it with my dad, which was really important, and uh, I wanted to be uh, the next hero. And I, at the same time, was kind of fascinated, as a little boy is, with the idea of crow magnets, because at that time, National Geographic was doing a whole bunch of uh, literature on crow magnets. And uh, so I was fascinated by these brutish kind of guys and Vikings. I mean, even today, people, you say Viking, and people kind of look around, because those guys had a heck of a reputation. They would just go into battle with almost no armor on. They went into battle, and so did the Greeks, and so did all the heroes. If you think about it, almost nude. Ooh. But they did, and so did the women. The Amazons did the same thing. They didn't wear a lot of armor. A hero doesn't need a lot of armor. He doesn't have to sit in a tank, and he doesn't have to be in a Humvee, although they can be. But to me, the hero is the guy that is willing to go out there and just do it no matter what. And maybe with just a little loincloth for the kids, but all in all, his, his job is to go out there and prevail. And he must prevail against anything in the general sense. He must prevail against anything that he finds wrong. And so that, I took that to, to my drawings. I put my drawings on my, the wall of my of my uh, cubicle because I was bored. My friend Ted Mayer used to come over and he would look at me and he'd go, what are you doing? They're not gonna pay you for that. I went, who cares, this is boring. Uh, one, some of the wonderful artists that worked for Mattel that they didn't even use. Guys that worked at great agencies. The head of the Raymond Lowy office in London would come over and shoot the breeze with me. I mean, these were guys that when I was at Art Center were my icons and they would come over and say, you know, Mark, what are you trying to draw there? And I'd say, I'm trying to draw a bear hero. I want a villain to be a bear. And a guy named Arch Pleasance, Canadian dude, he could draw anything. He says, hey, Mark, bears don't have shoulders. And I remember the day he said to me, bears don't have shoulders. It was like wonderful because I took the shoulders off the bear, and that became the first beast man. We couldn't use it because Lucas had already done the Wookiee. And as we got on with the line and everything started moving along, they said, it's too much like the Wookiee. So I went back and I found the kids were fascinated with apes, like I had been. Neanderthal, snake, apes, da 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 da. And so I made Beastman. That's the kind of ape like guy. He's on the evil side. He was a minion, so to speak, of Skeletor, the other hero. Or if you want, anti hero. So that became, I plugged him in where I had the bear. But nobody at this time was really interested. I still had the bear, I had He-Man, I had Skeletor already cooking, I had a good looking babe, uh, her name was Tila, and all of this stuff revolved in my imagination around a, uh, a, a castle. And this castle was the ultimate center of power. Okay, Roger Sweet, Derek Gay, came by my office because Mr. Rector, the president of Mattel, 
was on their case because Stuart Kenners had brought Star Wars out. It was trampling everybody. It was phenomenal. So Mr. Wagner says, what are we paying all you clowns for? Not me yet. But all you clowns for, um, we can't even come up with a mail action line except Clash of the Titans, Battlestar Galactica, we used to call it Wagon Dream in Space, and uh, something else. So I worked on the packaging and stuff for all of these, but they came by my office and they wanted to take my drawings and present them to Ray Wagner. Now this is the man. This is the top of Mattel, and Mattel is a very, very uh, compartmentalized company. And so uh, they said, yeah, we'd like to take him. We're going to show him to Ray for you. My boss at that time was this kind of crazy guy. His name was Shel Platt, but he knew Mattel. He had been there a long time, unlike me. And he came forward and he said, if you take his stuff, excuse me, you take him. And they went, well, you know, we normally don't take visual designers, that's why I was, to these kind of presentations. Shell said, if you take his stuff, you take him. Now this stuff, nobody paid me a dime for it. It's okay. I'm okay with Mattel right now, as I said here right now. I don't want him to give me anything, and I don't owe him them anything. So let's make that clear. Uh, I don't feel I've been cheated by Mattel. Mattel was okay with me. And so, uh, and I certainly have been okay with Mattel. So they took him to Ray Wagner, he took a look at him. He took a look at him, a whole bunch of stuff. But he couldn't leave this stuff, he'd come back to it. And, and uh, Roger, my, I, I guess my Skeletor, uh, he says that Ray didn't say anything. Well, gee, sitting back there by the projector and looking at my drawings on the wall, I remember Ray saying, you know what, there's something there, I don't know what it is, it's weird but I think we need to go with that one. And I remember him saying, let's take about $150,000, which in those days was a lot of money. And he said, let's take it to the next step. Let's see where it goes. Get rid of the other two. Uh, there was a couple of other concepts there that he didn't want at all. And he said, let's see where this goes and let's put a few spins on it. And marketing guys get going on it. Now the marketing guys at this time, marketing guys when you have anybody in, in here ever worked in a toy company? Does anybody in here know what marketing is? Yeah. How do you sell stuff, right? Basically, that's what it comes down to. Okay, the marketing guys, nobody wanted it because they all wanted to work on Barbie. Who wouldn't? And they all wanted to work on stuff that, you know, they thought maybe they could make a career out of. Nobody wanted to work on He-Man. Was the He-Man, by the way, at that time. So. They, they said, let's go with it. A guy named Mark Ellis stepped forward. He said, I'll do the marketing on it. But he was the last guy they hired. So poor Mark, he got thrown into this brand and we started working on it. I was lucky. There was a great sculptor. His name was Tony Guerrero. He had known my wife's family when he'd grown up in East Los Angeles. He'd known my wife's family before he and I ever met when we met. I speak a little Spanish, and especially slang, and we got along great. He would take my drawings, he took one look at them, and he says, oh, I want to take a crack at this. His boss didn't want him to, nobody wanted him to, but he was a really good sculptor. So they give him some slack, and he started working with me, and we start cranking the stuff out. Started with the figures, and we did something entirely different. I won't take up too much of your time and bore you, but this was quite different than the way Mattel had ever done a figure before. We did the full He-Man figure to scale, non-articulated. We did everything to scale instead of the way they normally did it, which is the body, the arms, and the head all separated. We didn't do that. We did the whole thing because what would happen when you did it what I call the cheaper way is they would try to get the head to be the production head and try to get the body and the arms to be all, so they wouldn't have to do the tooling twice. Well, when they would do that, there's a different shrink or a different expansion for the different types of plastic, like vinyl, which is a head. It doesn't, it doesn't shrink as much as the uh, ABS, which is the body, uh, does. So you constantly get these prototypes that would look like great big headed things. They all look like hobbits. And, <laughs> and Tony says, let's not do that. Let's knock it out, all one scale, and let everybody take a look at it that way. 
I said, they're going to not like it because to them that was wasted money, but we did that. We did that with He-Man. We did it with Skeletor. We did it with, with um, Beast Man. And I believe we did it with Tila. <clears throat> and we did it with all of them we possibly could until they finally just stopped us. But that's what we had. We painted it, sent it to the wonderful face painting people in uh, Mattel, and they painted it up. At that time, already, Mark Ellis was coming back and saying, you know what, we need to fill in certain price points. And he, he gave me the list. I could usually care less about money. I'm an artist. I don't care about you know, money. If, if I can pay the rent, I'm a happy camper. But you know what, they worried about filling out the product sheet. So I did the Battle Cat, which was, I took the tooling from Tarzan, which I'd worked on just previously, and I grabbed that cat, and I grabbed the ape too, but the ape wouldn't work, we couldn't get it to fit. But we did take Battle Cat. But the trouble is, if you look at Battle Cat very carefully, it's got a really broad back on it. So you couldn't put He-Man on Battle Cat, because his poor little legs wouldn't stretch out <laughs> sideways like this, you know, the cat wouldn't go in there. So that's why I invented the saddle. And, it, and if you could take something that's a negative and make it into a positive, well, that's a real winner too. So I made it so it would empower the cat. I made the face plate so it would empower the cat. And boom, we started off. Battle cat, the kids loved it. Well, <laughs> good toy for an unarticulated toy. <laughs> I mean, you know, the kids use their imagination. Here comes battle cat. You know, I put his stuff on and he's big and brave and nasty. And who wouldn't be afraid of a guy in a loincloth with a little leather thing on his chest riding on a tiger that's specially green and orange. And if he rode into a bar, nobody's gonna give him any trouble. So I succeeded. That was my hero. He was a true hero to me. And Skeletor too, believe it or not, was a hero. But he was the negative side. It's important to remember Skeletor, I had to fight hard to keep him from softening Skeletor because they didn't want to do Skeletor like that. So, we're, we've reached a stage where Ray Wagner said, yeah, but, and, and if you know any toy companies, especially Mattel, they won't do anything without testing it. They're gonna test everything then. I'm not, I'm not sure they don't test our shorts because they test everything and uh, nobody would test it because all of the glory was going to the people who didn't, quotes, deserve it, which is the development people. That's me. And Mark Dellis, as a marketing guy, he had no pull at all because he was fresh. But there was a lady there named Angie D'Amico. And somebody, we were testing with boys of the right age group, and somebody didn't have their product ready. Does anybody not understand what I just said? They didn't have it all painted up and pretty and ready to go. My stuff was ready. He-Man was ready. We put it in in front of these little kids, and I wasn't even supposed to be behind the, the two-way, one-way mirror. That was supposed to be just for marketing people and senior management. But Mark Ellis didn't know any better because he was a new guy. So he invited me, and I got to go sit in and watch this. And it wasn't even supposed to take place but we tested He-Man, Skeletor, Tila, and Beast-Man. All of them were painted, all of them were non-articulated, all of them looked great. We brought it in for the kids, and I'll never forget, there was one little kid there in a bomber jacket, and boy, what a piece of work he was. He must have drove his teachers and his parents crazy, because he was like one of those kids, just looked at the way he combed his hair, which was straight up, and you knew this kid, was a piece of work. So the facilitator, which is the marketing person slash tester, he leaves and he tells them, I'm gonna give you a bunch of Hot Wheels after you're done, but we need you to pick the one that's your favorite. And they had the Star Wars stuff in there and they had all the other stuff that was popular at the time. And let's face it, Star Wars was a great property and it was intimidating to even think of going against George Lucas's piece of Genius, but we were, and that's the way it was. We figured we'd get the crumbs. The kids, especially Mr. Bomber Jacket, they tried to steal the figures. <laughs> <laughs> he actually, it was hilarious. 
This kid actually stuck the figure inside this jacket. And he encouraged the guy coughing, who was really interested in Tila, and I don't blame him because Tila was really a babe. And he encouraged him to steal her too, so that you know he would he would be complicit in the crime. So the facilitator's watching all this, and he goes back in and he makes the kids give him the, the product, which they reluctantly did. <laughs> When he gave him the Hot Wheels, and by the way, this is kind of embarrassing, because uh, later on in my career, I was senior vice president of Hot Wheels. So <laughs> I got to see, not only, I got to see He-Man conquer that day, but I also got to see what was wrong with Hot Wheels. So everybody gets up and leaves. I'm walking on air. I can hardly wait to get downstairs to our dungeon and tell Ted Mayer, my buddy, and tell Tony Guerrero, the sculptor. And it was the happiest day, outside of the day I got married, it was the happiest day of my life. And I couldn't believe it. This was a validation of from the time I was just a kid, sketchbooks full of stuff. And all of a sudden, these kids liked it too. And it was moving, and it was wonderful. artistic influences when working on masters? Oh, wow. Everything. You know, uh, who, uh, everything from the classics, uh, I mean, everything from Michelangelo, Da Vinci, clear up through Frank Frazetta and the comic books. I was a big fan of EC Comics. I thought they were, when I was a kid, I would uh, buy them and hide them because my mother would throw them out if she saw me. You know, I liked the ones that were particularly involved in violence and gore and all the stuff you're not supposed to be interested in. And I liked that the best. And I would draw it continuously. And I was always fascinated by what went on inside. So I would draw it so you could see through what was going on inside. And uh, these guys that came back from the war, all of these veterans that EC hired, and later they went to DC, and of course they went to all the other Monstrous Warren and all the Monstrous uh, comic book companies. But these guys in the service had learned to draw like Jack Davis, um, uh, Willie, um, I'm sorry, uh, Will Eisner's spirit. Uh, all these things to me were the very essence of great drawing because you could just feel the action coming off the, the page. And also the book covers. The book covers Frank Frazetta did. Has anybody ever seen a Frank Frazetta painting? You know, he'd drawn as a ghost for Al Cap on Little Abner for 12 years. He must have gone crazy, because he was a better artist than Al Cap ever dreamed of being. And, you know, he had a great career, and his stuff, I wanted the packaging, in, and I, by the way, I was in charge of packaging too. I wanted the packaging to look just like for as I did it. And I found a guy that would paint him for me, Rudy O'Brien. And he did, in oil. Did this, nobody paints in oil. Nobody does columns in oil in the toy industry. Now, have I answered, kind of answered your question? Or <laughs> that was one of the questions, yes, but that's great. <laughs> so now you, you picked, did you pick all of the artists that worked on the toy packaging? On the packaging, yeah, absolutely. Even Bill George is a friend of mine. And he did the later stuff, which I, when I was no longer in control, I went to another toy company, and when I was no longer in control, they got sick of working with Rudy, because they had to work with oil. And anybody that's ever worked in oil, it's a wonderful, forgiving media when you're working in it, but later on, while you're waiting for it to dry, it's very unforgiving, and it will mess up so easy. So they had to handle it very carefully. And Mattel isn't good at handling things very carefully. Now the interesting thing was, every one of the paintings that he did wound up on some senior vice president's wall or in one of the executive offices. But at the time, they whined and cried and carried on about it. So if you look at the later stuff that was done post-1981, maybe early 1982, it starts to look quite different than the stuff that was done in the launch, which is what they call the first couple of years of toys. Now, what did you know yourself that Masters of the Universe was gonna be a huge hit? Um, 
I, I, I couldn't believe what happened at the toy test. And even Angie D'Amico, the, the toy test lady, she comes in, she says, we got a hit. And Mark Ellis, I think he was about to wet himself because here he goes from being the fall guy, taking all the crap. You know, it's a great story of the underdog. And here he is all of a sudden walking around making decisions that are going to lead to billions, billions, not millions, billions of dollars. And so all of a sudden he had a lot of power. And he was very nice about it. He never gave me any trouble. They handed it over to other people who did. But Mark Ellis was always a good guy, in my book. He was one of the heroes. And I don't think we could have done it without him. But they wanted people that were, quote, experts in entertainment, animation, advertising, and the trade. When you say the trade, that's Toys R Us and all the people that are the outlets. They wanted people that had connections that way. And so they got kind of gradually edged out Mark Ellis. And in my opinion, for what it's worth, just, just an artist, in my opinion, when they did that, they also so started to think they knew about everything. And anybody, including me, that thinks they know about everything, they're going to screw up. OK, so we're uh, almost out of time here. So we're going to take a few minutes to take some questions from the audience. Yes. Not fair. Uh, of course, look at this ego setting up here. I recommend getting the toys and playing with them yourself and making up your own story. That was what Castle Grayskull did. <laughs> Castle Grayskull, I sculpted Castle Grayskull myself. I sculpted it at my desk. And I had a secretary come in and help me because I need somebody to help make the shingles on the roof. And the reason I did that is because I recognized that kids don't have a place to play at that time. This is 1979, 1980. And I realized they couldn't go outside and play anymore. So I wanted to do a play set that would be in front of the TV or in the room and that they could, and that they could uh, make up their stories. I wanted everybody to make up their story. In uh, my reference material, I have a play map that uh, was a moat that went around Castle Grayskull. They costed it out. But if you look at the play map, there's a lot of the play that, that I was trying to get people to get into with me. There's the Well of, the well of Souls, which was this, uh, the, the recent sculptors of uh, He-Man have done the Well of Souls, uh, done a nice job. It's basically my drawing. And when they did the Well of Souls, that also was part of what I would like you to make up. Uh, so with all respect, uh, and if Gary Goddard was here and uh, all the people from Filmation, they would be all ticked off. But I never wanted any of that stuff. They did it and they have to do it. That's part of the, the business. But I never wanted that. I wanted kids to make up their own story. I wanted them to have their own, their own way of telling the story. And I was hoping the toys would have the power to do it. Because again, I could never think in terms of money. And by the way, I, I'm not up here being humble about it. I've had a very good life. After, after I did uh, He-Man, I went to Tomi Toys, the Japanese company. They were wonderful. After that, I went to Playmates and did the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with Peter Laird. I did Men in Black. I did um, all kinds of, uh, Men in Black was a gas. All these things have been fun. And my wife and I have done okay. I'm not whining. I'm just saying that I'm a toy guy. And uh, I would love to be an animator. If I, could have, if I could have worked with the Pixar people, I would have started all over again and, and been willing to start on the board uh, all over again. I have time for two more questions. Yes? Okay, so Mark, first, thank you for creating probably the best uh, looking toys in the history of toys, in my opinion. And I think if you can put yourself back in the early 80s, um, the He-Man line is far too Um, you know, I, I think maybe the cartoon.
cartoon or also so enjoyable to watch that everything was just so aesthetically pleasing. My question, since you said every question doesn't have to be positive, um, how did the Shira line fail so miserably? Because if every He-Man toy looks <coughs> straight eight-year-old kid watching He-Man, and these are the best looking guys I've ever seen on TV, and the toys, you know, are, you know, exactly the same. But when she comes out, you've basically got this, you know, these average-looking figures with these giant messes of hair, and I, you know, when you describe kind of your love for making Tila, and I imagine many of the other characters, male or female, I don't think that translated for the she line, so what happened there? Really good, really good question, and I I have to tell you, this gets to where it sounds like a spy novel. But when we tested Tila with the little boys, she was a babe. I mean, she was built. I don't know any other way to put it. <laughs> but if you saw the drawing and the sculpture, when Tony first did it, I had to tell him, you know what? Take it down a notch. Because, wow, these little kids loved her. The little boys loved her. And there was an up-and-coming marketing person at Mattel, and they said, wow, you know, if they like her so much, let's do a girl's line. And we'll do a whole girl's line based on Tila. But here's the catch. The mothers hated Tila. They hated her because their little boys all of a sudden were showing something that they hadn't seen before. <laughs> We have time for just one more quick question. Any more questions in the audience? Nope. Oh, okay. yes. Really good point. Uh, you know, Mattel had Barbie. Barbie was what we used to call a cash cow, and we meant that in every way. Barbie started off as a pornographic doll that was brought over from Germany and shown to Ruth Adler. And she saw it, and she said, why should I do paper dolls, which she was thinking about doing at the time. And she said, I'll do this. And if you saw this original doll, which I have, you would say, oh, I see where Barbie came from. But in answer directly to your question, I'd rather say this. If I was going to do a hero for today, it would be a female hero. Because it's the time. Because the heroes of our time are women. <laughs> Us men had our day. You know, we went out and did the warrior thing. And now, much to our shame, we see a bunch of people shooting AK-47s up in the sky and claiming to be warriors. But the women are the warriors. You watch the next 20 years, you're going to see. If I, if I was going to do a line, I'd do a strapping girl, and she would be my hero. And by the way, get this one. No magical powers. You notice how they always assign magical powers to a woman, like she can't really handle herself? I love the girl with the dragon tattoo. She could handle herself, and she didn't need magical powers. So my take on it is, I'm sorry, but they had Barbie. And by the way, Barbie hit the wall about 1987. They don't like to talk about this, but when Cabbage Patch from Coleco came out, oh boy, did they cream Barbie, because they were nurturing dolls. They came from a Cabbage Patch. They were kind of mystical. That's where babies come from. And it hit Barbie right where she couldn't stand it. She was, she was plastic and she, she was all about the body. And she was all about, I can do anything. And here come the little cabbage patch that went, take care of me, I'm just an ugly little girl. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mattel did the same thing as Coleco did. They made the mistake. 
I had a boss one time, and she said, one, when I was, I was a senior vice president at Mattel when I went back. They, they hired me back. So who gets the vindication here? They hired me back as a senior vice president. When I was a senior vice president, my boss told me, Mark, you tend to say way too much and talk too much and never underestimate the power of greed in the toy industry. And I'm sorry to say that that's a fact, that she was right about that one thing. So Annette, did I answer your question? All right, well, Mark, thank you so much for your uh... Uh, is everyone here planning on seeing Toy Masters tonight? You know, uh, watch Toy Masters and you'll see the kind of nastiness that exists at the toy company, including me, by the way. You know, uh, the way you go, who you believe, and all that stuff, that's your business. But the fact is, you'll see what it's really all about. When you're looking at it, you'll recognize the people up there. You'll know who they are and what they are. And that's your business, including me, by the way. So have a really good time, enjoy it. The two guys, uh, I, I reviewed it, I'm fine with it. I don't agree with it and everything, but how could I? But the fact is, it's, it, it pretty much does its best to tell the truth and give you an idea of what the toy industry in America is really like. Don't forget, when you buy a toy for your child, part of the money you spend on the toy goes for the liability insurance that pays if that child hurts itself or even kills itself. And I've seen both happen, I'm sorry to say. And so remember that, that's the kind of industry you're talking about. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.